Hello, and welcome back to the League of Josh podcast. My name is Joshua, and I am your host. Today's episode was recorded on May 19th, 2021. Today I am joined by Lucas Hampel. Lucas has recently finished his educational and practical requirements on the pathway to becoming a physiotherapist. All of this hard work and effort has been somewhat for naught, as upon returning to Canada, he as well as many other Canadian practitioners are bogged down by the slow drudge of bureaucracy in conjunction with COVID-19. We discuss this, as well as a variety of other topics, including the concept of beauty and why we find things to be beautiful, or what that even means, as well as specialization in academia, in which students are encouraged to know everything about one thing, at the detriment of knowing many things about many things, and how this is potentially farther detrimental to our knowing of everything about all the things. Anyway, we dive pretty deep into the things here, and so we hope that you enjoy the thing. Thanks. Awesome. Okay, so I'm sitting here today with Lucas Hampel, and Lucas has just graduated from Brunel University in London, England, That's and he is a physiotherapist, a registered physiotherapist. Um, hopefully, Right. Unregistered Sorry, present. unregistered, yeah, hoping to take uh, the exam yeah. soon, mm -hmm. and uh, an artist and also a friend. So my mm -hmm. goal today is to talk to him a little bit about physiotherapy and the body and then incorporate that into art and sure. maybe understand the holistic relationship between the two and also your uh, enjoyment and infatuation for botany and how that plays a role oh, in art as well. The dream. Yeah, oh. exactly. So exactly. let's, let's try to fun. tie those three together. Super sweet. Yeah, no, um, I'm super, thanks for having me on. I'm super stoked to have a little chat and catch up and everything else. Of course. Yeah, um, yeah it's been a bit of a mess this last year uh, mm -hmm. and it's just continued to do so. Uh, the physiotherapy program has been great, um, but the, I didn't think the bureaucracy would be the hardest part of my degree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Frankly, it's been a hassle trying to get back into the Canadian system, despite the fact that they complained in the last decade or so that were under understaffed for, physio for physiotherapy and other medical practices, they put all of these barricades in the ability to actually move into the practice that it makes it really hard for anyone to even be incentivized to go through that process. Mm -hmm. um, it's been huh, a process, but we're getting there and it feels like I'm getting some experience, even if I'm not formally licensed right. at this point. Is that made worse by you coming back into the country from another country from studying in yes. England and coming back into Canada, does that make the, the process more difficult? Yeah, so typically, um, if you're doing your program in Canada, you have two exams that you have to take. Physiotherapy is the only one that has these two exams. There's a written um, 200 multiple choice question just to test your uh, knowledge base so you have the background to be able to know what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And then there's this clinical component, which is this really sterile kind of artificial scenario-based module thing, which has been, purported by every physiotherapist that I've talked to and every senior physiotherapist I've talked to as one of the worst formatted exams in the existence of things. Mm -hmm. um, anecdotally, I've heard senior physios that said, I cried for three days after I took that exam. <laughs> like, like it is that poor and it's not necessarily testing you on what it actually is like to engage with a patient as a physiotherapist. It's testing on whether or not you can check boxes perfectly. Mm. So when you walk into the room, you're like, hi, my name's so-and-so. I'm a student physiotherapist. Are you comfortable with treatment today? Do you consent to the treatments that I'm giving? And it's just making sure you hit every single one of those boxes, even though for the most part, when you're engaging with an individual, you're engaging in a much more organic environment. And that makes people more comfortable and has been evidence to make people more comfortable, which allows them to agree to your treatment more easily so that they can get better. Mm -hmm. So it's this semantic process that's been really frustrating. Um, I don't know where I was going with this, but ultimately, long story short, the licensing process has been gated by this whole agency that has these two exams. As an international student um, and coming from a university that is uh, not formally recognized by the agency, despite the fact that people from that university have gone through the agency to come back to Canada and practice, mm -hmm. they require that you go through a credentialing process. The credentialing process essentially is you send them your degree with your transcripts and they check a box and they say, congratulations, now pay us a thousand dollars. And then you can pay as well to take these two exams. So usually the credentialing process takes between two and four weeks. With the pandemic, it's taking between four and probably 12. <laughs> 
on top of the delays to the written, the two written exams and the clinical exam, which mm -hmm. are, have been backdated for the last year and a half. Right. So it's an additional step on top of an ultimately just contrived system that they've presented to us. Mm -hmm. And it's not getting better. They're, the agency has so much power and control over this kind of component of the physiotherapy practice that they've at this point stated that they're just going to wait the pandemic out. Really? Yeah. So there's a couple places like British Columbia and Alberta have offered alternative examinations for this clinical exam, mm -hmm. but they're coming out at about the same time as the clinical exam that this agency is going to be putting out. And the exam, the clinical exam is the one that everyone has an issue with because the written one's just a knowledge based exam. And that makes yeah. sense understandably and things like that. The clinical exam doesn't have any validity. Um, it's not been evidenced to be more effective than other practices. Um, comparing it to other developed nations that have physiotherapy programs, Australia and England and a lot of places in Europe don't have a clinical exam or a clinical exam format because they assume that after a master's and 1,025 hours of clinical experience, you would be competent to practice as your, in your profession. One would hope so. You would hope, right? Ultimately, that's where we're at. So I'm sitting in limbo. A lot of us are sitting in limbo. I work in a clinic with two colleagues that are in the same boat, essentially. Um, we're all waiting to have this agency like stop holding our entire lives in, in stasis until they can get things sorted. Is the, was the agency previously uh, not a government entity or has uh, it always it's, been? It's like, it's a strange agency. I'm not a hundred super familiar with all the minutia of it, but mm -hmm. it was, I think it was developed initially by the government as a standardization process. Mm -hmm. I understand the merit of that. Obviously you want to make sure that everyone coming into the country is capable and competent in the practice. Yeah, of course. But at this point they haven't really changed their formula to accommodate for things that have been happening or developments in the science or things like that. It just seems that they have kind of kept on the same course and just charge us an extra $4,000 total to take these two exams and kind of go on with their day. The part that bothers me is that I think part of the reason that the provincial colleges, because there's three different agencies that are interacting here, uh, the provincial colleges get a cut from the funding for the exams. So they have their fingers in the pot to say, we kind of want these exams around too. So we continue to get our stipend to make sure we can continue functioning. Mm -hmm. So that's where we're at right now. Do you know what the history is with the clinical examination, whether that has become something more recently? I, the the um, protocol sounds very mm -hmm. progressive to me. So mm -hmm. I'm okay. wondering if that's something that's been implemented more recently. Uh, no, it's been it's since the CAPR was established i'm pretty sure the capr is the agency i'm speaking of mm -hmm. um, since that agency has been established they have had this clinical component um, and they've seen they brought it in because they wanted to make sure previously a lot of the physiotherapy practice was very much manipulation based or joint mobilization based very hands-on making sure you're checking the boxes to do the things in the correct way as current evidence has progressed there is less and less evidence to say that the things with the manipulations are doing anything particular to a joint or a spinal position or a muscle or things like that, that actually is lasting more than a day max mm -hmm. kind of thing. And the effect that it's actually causing is mostly neurophysiological and causing a small tissue change or a nervous system change that allows that joint to move a little bit more freely for a period of time before it sets back. Mm -hmm. So to say that we need to specifically be moving a joint in a very particular way isn't as important now as to say, as long as we're doing the action or the movement in an effective way for the individual, our hands-on technique isn't as integral. Does that when make sense? That, yeah, yeah, yeah. When did that start to change? Because uh, in my it's in the last decade or so, probably. Yeah. Um, and it's been, it's big in Australia has talked about it a lot. When I was in the UK, all of our degree and all of our program, we did a lot of like hands-on stuff to do assessments and tests for joint ligaments and things like joints, ligaments and muscles. But they, harshed on us to say ultimately a lot of these things or especially the things that are saying we're mobilizing you know c5 on c6 and we're causing the neck joints to rotate so it allows the head to turn better mm -hmm. um, those type of conditions or actions they don't really have any specificity you can say you're moving six and seven but you're or five c5 and c6 on top of each other but you're also moving every other joint nearby probably in different planes 
Um, they've taken seasoned practitioners and done CTs and MRIs while they're doing these MOBs and things like that. And it moves everything. <laughs> it's like, I'm specific to say you're specifically moving one spot versus another is very unlikely. Right. And our hands aren't quite sensitive enough to detect that. Yeah. And well, that's the issue with complex systems is that you're, you're doing a lot more than you think you are. And exactly. you're also doing a lot less than you think you are, depending mm -hmm. on where you're actually yeah. Trying to trying to change things. Yeah, exactly. And so it's like to say that we're definitively doing one thing is unlikely. Odds are we have a broader effect on the tissue area in general, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, bit of a mixed bag. I'm wondering uh, where a lot of the. Oh, sorry about the dog. <laughs> that's okay. I have five of them. I'm sure they'll lose their okay. minds at some point. Cool. Sounds good. Um, I'm wondering where the majority of the recent literature is coming out about physiotherapy. I understand that Australia is one of the, they're leading the way in a lot of stuff. They were the first one to really dive into yogic practices to mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. put quantitative data into things rather yep. than more qualitative stuff. And they were yep. very revolutionary because I think going into my second and third year, I started to look more into that literature and understand that doing yin yoga and long hold stretches weren't good for explosive athletes. Whereas yeah. That's been a that's been a consistent practice for lots of athletes over the past. Mm, yeah, ever There's since actually, yoga made its way into Western mm -hmm. uh, culture. Yeah, exactly. And yoga is a really cool practice in the sense that it, um, especially a more kind of traditional vinyasa or ashtanga type practice, it trains um, a particular muscle contraction called isometrics or eccentric eccentric uh, contractions, which are essentially the muscles contracting while it's resisting gra or stretching and resisting gravity. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the most force driven uh, movements or one of the movements that allows for the most amount of force to go through a muscle. So yoga allows for range of motion changes with active components in them. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yes. In the sense that we're not creating laxity that doesn't have control within it. Mm -hmm. Touching on the aspect you were talking about, about uh, explosive athletes and things like that and stretching, there's, I picked up a book. I wonder if I have it here, just a sec. Um, it is a fun little read called, yeah, I do, um, The Science and Physiology of Flexibility and Stretching by David Bem. Um, it was published actually recently, I think it was 2018, um, as far as research goes. And it's a comprehensive analysis of stretching and stretching physiology and the mechanisms by which it occurs. And ultimately, he said, it doesn't do a lot of the things that people purported to do. It doesn't necessarily decrease pain. It doesn't necessarily decrease uh, delayed onset muscle soreness after exercise. It actually decreases, uh, ooh, was it squat strength and sprinting velocity by four to 7% after mm -hmm. significant stretching? Mm -hmm. um, because you're actually putting those muscles into a deformed state that isn't as contractile effective. Um, to think of muscle fibers, they kind of act as these interlocking little meshes. And when we contract a muscle, they come together. If we deform the tissue thinking we're stretching it and getting ourselves ready, that sets it so it's at a deficit off the start. So when you try to create a contraction, it only has this little edge to actually create that initial contraction. So right. it takes more time to start that first one and then got, get the better cross-linking to occur and cause that muscle to shrink and contract. Mm -hmm. um, often what he was saying was for athletes and things that are trying to get into activity or ballistic activity, something like a cardiovascular warm-up or something that primes the muscles. So uh, not ballistic stretching, but like ballistic movements and like doing little jump arounds and hops and like high knees and those type of movements will be more useful for an individual to facilitate those tissues to function in those environments. What would be an example of a ballistic stretch compared to a ballistic warm-up? Uh, ballistic stretching would be something more like, uh, I always think of there's one exercise um, pulsing into a hamstring stretch essentially. So doing a reaching, like kind of almost a bounce into the hamstring, mm -hmm. into a hamstring stretch or doing big swings with your legs and things like that okay. are a little, those type of movements tend to be less effective um, than doing something like a little jogger on the room or high knees or something that has that little bit of movement in there or like lateral hops and things like that. Uh, those type of movements are still a contraction and expand or contraction and things like that, but they don't have that relaxed component that you're kind of bouncing into. I was going to ask if you thought that that was uh, the reason for that was because yeah, you don't have that, that control really mm -hmm. with your, and with I your high knees, a, you're having to pull up and with, yeah. if you're doing leg swings, it's more just a, it's a lot more relaxed. passive. Yeah. Yeah relaxed flop almost, right? So yeah, exactly. the high knees yeah. has the control and a lot of those movements have an active component that helps to facilitate that movement. Mm -hmm. So by doing that, it both primes the muscle to contract in those ranges and also 
causes circulation to increase in those areas to facilitate that muscle functioning. Mm -hmm. so I'm a, yeah, that's very interesting. I'm a, mm -hmm. I'm a big proponent of, do you, have you ever heard of Ido Portal? I have not. So Ido Portal is the trainer for Conor McGregor. And oh, okay. He's a, he's a, he's a mm -hmm. big supporter of functional movement. So mm -hmm. a lot of the activity that he does is, I think this is what his philosophy is. I hope that I can get this right. Yep. But he's, he's moving his body in a way that stretches muscle while also building muscle. So when you're doing a workout, you're actively trying to stretch at the same time as you're doing the workout so that you're strengthening in length. I think that's a, mm -hmm. a good way to put it. So for example, I'm not sure what the technical name for it is, but a hamstring stretch where you're standing and you have two weights and you Basi oh. You're basically going as far as you can down. Yeah, and you're um, to... I think it's a Romanian deadlift almost. No, not quite. So not you're, quite. so you're, so you could stand on you. a box. You could stand yeah. on a box and, yeah, have two dumbbells in each hand, and, and you're down. you're essentially just letting them take you. Yeah, so you're you're trying to let them mm -hmm. pull you as far to the ground as you can, and you're trying mm -hmm. to stretch out. And I found that that's really helpful for my hamstrings. Yeah, because I think that's and the. Yeah, you go. You mentioning that actually is specific. There's actually research um, from Australia and other places talking about that's a, what he's what that movement is and is an eccentric outer range exercise. Mm -hmm. So we're causing a muscle contraction against force against the force of a weight and the force of gravity while it's stretching. Mm -hmm. So that in order creating that extra engagement when we're moving towards those outer ranges facilitates that lengthening, but also that functional strength in those ranges. Mm -hmm. Um, an individual I follow, he's a bit of an eclectic. I found, I met him in Aust or when I was in the UK, uh, his name is Matt Smith. Um, he does a lot of training. He start, he's, uh, trying to do circus uh, performance stuff and things like that, cool. but he's self-trained pretty much to, um, be able to do full splits, uh, elevated and, mm -hmm. uh, like handstands and all this mobile hyper or really intense mobility stuff through the use of what is effectively eccentric outer range strengthening. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's really cool to see like a corroboration with another individual that is in a high level, high level of ath athleticism saying, Hey, these type of exercises are really useful for creating strength throughout a range. Right. Mm -hmm. Ultimately when we're doing gym exercises, things like dead or like uh, bicep curls and the like, right. It's a contraction that is concentric. It just shrinks the muscle. Right. Yeah. And we're only really creating that contraction in, the, if you have the full range of the muscle contraction, we're only using that middle portion, the most effective part. Right. Mm -hmm. The, when you're fully closed, that's a really ineffective range. And when you're fully extended, that's the other really ineffective range. Because when you're fully closed, it can't go any closer. Mm -hmm. And when you're at full range, you can't go any further. So right. by creating strength in those areas, we allow for that joint and that muscle to function throughout. Whenever we're doing other activities then, and we're in those weird ranges, we can still use that muscle rather than just having a laxity or an inability to contract at all. What does laxity mean? Uh, laxity, looseness. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, right. So a, relaxed, yeah. essentially. Mm, yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Relaxed, lax, kind mm. of all, all ties together, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, ultimately, it's really cool to see that that's kind of corroborated in a couple, couple different areas and is kind of coming to the forefront for movement and um, functional range of motion based exercises. Mm -hmm. Well, I find that the best way that I've, I, I took a little while off of working out after my Achilles just to, and I find it difficult to get back into working out after something like that. Oh, of Any, course. anytime you take away, anytime you step away from exercising, it's always disheartening to come back and realize that you can't move your body the way that you did. And yeah, you're, you're tight in a lot of different areas that you don't mm -hmm. remember. And so you, you end up having to rebuild from nothing. And one oh, of yeah, the things absolutely. that has helped me quite a bit is trying to more or less have fun in exercises and also being very, being thoughtful of the actual process to get to control. I don't think that, mm -hmm. and in my opinion, please correct me if I'm wrong. I'd love no, to hear what you think about this, but I tend to start off more flailing my body around. I'm likely prone to injury for that. And then I got you. as time goes on, I get stronger in that movement. And mm -hmm. then once I become stronger, then I actually have the ability to start controlling. Yeah. So okay. I yeah. know that a lot of people harp on the idea of control right away. You have to control the weight, control the weight. But yeah, in my experience, I've just kind of flailed my body around. If I'm okay. doing pull-ups or something, I just yeah, try just to get struggle up there. with it till you get it right. Exactly, and then once you get it a few times, then it's a little bit easier to. I and mm -hmm. as we were just talking about, I tend to do eccentric almost yeah. always, and just negative as slow as I can all the way down, and then yeah, and those are a great way to start in mm -hmm. any in any of that type of stuff. Um, 
So you talking about flailing a little bit, uh, there's an aspect of training and motor learning. So that's kind of the process of learning movement patterns. Um, it talks about random practice, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, which essentially says if we're doing a set of regimented exercises, doing them in the same order every time uh, actually is not as helpful for learning all of those movements as shifting the pattern every time. So if you were to say do push-ups, pull-ups, uh, push-ups, pull-ups, chin-ups, back-to-back, switch it up one day and go pull-ups, push-ups, chin-ups, switch it up and go pull-ups, push-ups, chin-ups, like alternate it around. And by doing those shifts and those changes, it actually trains the brain to recognize the different ways in which we can move between these patterns. So if we're struggling with a movement initially, um, often it's good to mix it into a different environment, but also uh, take time in that movement and play with kind of the in-betweens all the time. Mm -hmm. um, in yoga practice, at least the way I've practiced and the way I was trained is always to give these kind of variations and options and allow people to explore in the spaces that they have difficulty. Because ultimately, the thing that will be the most useful for a person's individual body will be the thing that they find the most effective for that movement. Mm -hmm. um, and in finding those things that work for them, they can then begin to blend into a place where they can assign or assume a form that is more reflective of whatever practice they're doing. So for some people for chin ups, they may flail around or try to get to the top. They may not even be able to, they may have to use a chair and get all the way to the top of the bar. And then, as you said, eccentric control all the way down. Mm -hmm. Ultimately that's going to be as useful as if, or as useful, if not more useful for someone who is in that space than someone who's starting at full length and not even able to get into any in-between ranges. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of a fun balance in between more than anything. What do you, I, I know that a lot of people really like the idea of having perfect form, and I found that actually avoiding perfect form is more beneficial for me because then I'm training in a range of motion that's more realistic for my actual life. So mm -hmm. as, a, as a volleyball player, you land in a lot of different ways and people tend to get injured a lot, I think because they're not practicing landing out of control. And a lot yeah. of exercises are in control. You're harped on to be in control all the time. That's dogma. You have to be mm -hmm. in control, perfect form. And you can totally notice when people do have perfect form, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's but then, yeah. But then when, when you watch people play sports, it's very chaotic. It's, mm -hmm. it's you're out of control a lot of the time. And so mm -hmm. I think that's something that's becoming less dogmatic in mm -hmm. at least high level athleticism yeah. is being in, mm -hmm. in perfect control all the time. You want to mm -hmm. train your muscles to be a little bit out of control or to handle the moments where you are out of yeah. control. And that's that, and that's that idea of random practice. I agree. Um, perfect form is such a weird principle because ultimately everyone's bodies are so different and so functionally different mm -hmm. that to say that you have to have a specific posture or a specific element of movement isn't really evidence anymore. Even like seated in a chair for good posture, sitting in front of a computer or at a desk, right? Mm -hmm. We always assign, oh yeah, 90, 90, 90, make sure your eyes are level with the screen or within yeah. a certain range, have your hands at elbows at 90, roughly wrists or the slight flexion, et cetera, et cetera. No I one feel, sits I feel way. personally attacked. I know, I'm sorry, I'm assaulting you. <laughs> I'm in the same boat. I'm in a chair with no back right now. So I'm slouching, yeah. sitting up. <laughs> but ultimately, the thing that's the most important is that we don't maintain any posture for a very significant sustained amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, by having that little bit of that equilibrium or that ability to move through these different shapes and different spaces, it actually protects our, or maintains our bodies such that we don't have these sustained position injuries that occur. Mm -hmm. So um, someone working at a desk, for instance, um, like I am right now with my job pres presently, if I'm sitting like this, sloped over, head forward, like uncomfortable the whole time, for an hour and a half, my body is going to hate me, right? Ultimately, you're causing a stretch to all of the capsular structures and ligamentous structures around your spine. You're putting your head into deep, uh, deep extension. It's a lot of positions that we usually, in our normal day-to-day -day that would be typical, don't hold for those periods of time. Mm -hmm. So taking that moment of self-awareness to going, okay, how am I sitting? And just adjusting for a couple minutes, maybe standing up, doing a little loop around the room, anything that allows you to kind of create that dynamic movement again and keeping you out of one, st one still position for a period of time is the most important component of wellness in general, really, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Sedentation is the thing that tends to ruin our bodies or cause our bodies to change significantly. Sedentation meaning sitting, watching yeah. TV, doing nothing else. Um, yeah, our bodies like to be lazy. That's an inherent feature, right? Mm -hmm. If we don't have to use energy, 
we won't use energy, right? Okay. If we don't have to make a muscle contract, our body's like, sweet, we'll just stop using that muscle and then it atrophies and then why can't I do the thing I used to be able to do, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, well, that destroys the joints as well. I, mm. I know that there's research on people that don't have the neural mechanism to actually tell them when their joints are sore. So then they'll end up sitting in the exact same position for extended periods of time. There's a um, disconcerting video of a serial killer being interviewed and it's a three hour video sped up in about two minutes. And the guy sits in the exact same position the entire time. That's unsettling. It is. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, so that's just kind of a, yeah, an uh, example, yeah, gotcha. but, but so people actually do have, they're, they're lacking that neural mechanism to yeah. move around and mm -hmm. that ends up destroying their joints. And it reminds mm -hmm. me of Zen practices where people brag about how still how, they can, yeah how, yeah, how sore they get. I mean, for me, mm -hmm. when I did my, my meditation retreat, it was, that was the biggest thing is that you have to get over that hump of, your deep desire to move. It's almost as mm. if you're, it feels a little bit like paralysis. You really want to move, but you kind of have yeah. to go mind over matter and yeah. not move. It's that, that aspect of willpower. And there's like, there is something to be said about finding stillness and finding a position that is stable and comfortable for you. Mm -hmm. But ultimately for most of our day to day, we don't, humans were never really all that still, right? We moved yeah. around. We, the most still we usually were was in sleep. Um, so to say that there's kind of that in between or that interplay is always interesting. And it's really, I've been doing a lot of reading on persistent pain and chronic pain type conditions and things like that. Often when people have chronic pain, they may experience pain in an area for a long period of time, but over time, the specificity of that pain decreases and our brains actually begin to develop such that we have a harder time mapping where a sensation is in a location. So Hmm. Like to, to give an example, say we have our palm, right? Mm -hmm. Usually we can d d d differentiate two different points in that palm, right? Pretty easily. If we had like a fork, we could tell the two, two different prongs are right there. Yeah. If someone's had persistent pain through a hand and a wrist for a long period of time, that two point differentiation becomes fuzzier. It becomes harder to recognize where we're feeling things between those two locations. And often in and of, or that process in and of itself can make it harder to even become aware of where that hand is in space. Wow. So that has an impact on proprioception then. Exactly. Huge impacts on proprioception and even perception of one's, one's limbs. Yeah. Um, there was a really fun, fun, pardon me, uh, uh, intimidating anecdote about persistent pain. I was doing a lecture, lecture series called a uh, pain foundation series, the BC, the BC pain Found, or federation, federation foundation, either way. Um, and they had an individual that had uh, persistent pain in their hand and wrist. Uh, my goodness, my brain is complex regional pain syndrome is the specific definition that she was diagnosed with. Um, and her, in her dialogue and in her visual and perceptual field, she felt her left hand was swollen, like massive compared to the other hand. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hands were the same size, yep. but visually and cognitively, there's, there's Henry, um, visually and cognitively, she believed that the one hand was bigger. And they went to her and said, why do you think it's bigger? And she says, well, can't you see it's huge, it's swollen. And they went, well, let's do a water, a volumetric water test, which essentially means they fill a bottle of jug with water and they put your hand into a certain depth. That's so right? smart. Wow, so and cool. And they put one hand into one and they compare it to the other. And they're the same mm -hmm. within a milliliter. And yep. she's like, oh, that doesn't make any sense because I can see it as larger. It is larger. Mm -hmm. And so it's that dissociate, we have a cognitive dissociation that begins to occur when our, when our bodies start sending us signals that aren't reflective of the reality that we have mm -hmm. in the same way that we can have this deconstructed movements or this inability to feel different areas of our bodies when we're sitting and things like that. Often we think we're taking a posture or assuming a good, a good, a healthful posture when we may actually be slouched in a corner, right? Like, yeah. and you won't even notice because our brains map our brains are in a black box and they're just getting information from all of our sensory structures that are habituated to a certain pattern. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's this fun interplay. That's really interesting. I know that for the occipital lobe, there are as more or many external areas of the brain impacting that occipital connection. So when mm -hmm. you see something, there's as much interplay between your brain and that information as there is the actual external world and your occipital mm -hmm. lobe. And so yeah. I'm, I'm interested in that there was obviously a lot going on in her mind that was impacting her, her visual perception as well. That reminds me that 
women tend to overestimate their body size and men tend to underestimate their body size. So I wonder if that had any impact on, on that particular and, affliction. And it may very well. Mm -hmm. um, persistent pain and chronic pain. They're, I'm using the term persistent pain because that's kind of the way that the dialogue has been going. Because yeah. persistent pain is something that uh, linguistically is more mutable as a definition than chronic pain. Mm -hmm. When humans assign something criticity, it indicates that there's something that they can't change, right? right? Okay. So by switching the language, we allow for people to conceptualize the ability to create change. Mm -hmm. um, fun dialogues about, um, there's a persistent pain, there's a discussion about how people describe their pain as well. Um, it's a tangent altogether, but it's um, when someone says, I have pain, have in English indicates a possession, mm -hmm. right? It, it's, there's an aspect of ownership. And if we own something, it's something that we possess and we don't want to let go of. Right. Right. To even simply, whether or not you believe it or not, shift the dialogue from I have something to I experience something. Mm -hmm. Experiences are transient inherently, right? There's something that happens to us and it's something that will change over time, right? It might have, I might have had the experience of sadness, experience of happiness, experience of loneliness, experience of jubilation, whatever it might be. But it's something that I had and something that changes, right? So when you're talk, when I talk with people that have these persistent pain states, often I'm using terms like the pain perception and mm -hmm. to experience pain and your persistent pain condition that you're experiencing, because those types of dialogues shift the mentality and shift that internal dialogue about what your pain experience or what your sensation experience is, is in, in the case with this hand and this uh, difference between men and women overestimating and underestimating, underestimating body size. Mm -hmm. By changing the way that we describe ourselves and describe the experiences we have, we can change the feelings we have in the same place. Um, there's this, uh, whoa, bio, it's called the biopsychosocial model of pain and in a, or disability. Mm -hmm. And long and the short of it, um, our biology affects our experience of pain and disability. Our psychology affects our pain and dis our experience of pain and disability, and our social environment will affect our um, experience of pain and disability. Mm -hmm. And the interplay of all three makes it such that any description of an injury becomes this very nuanced and very parsable component of someone's rehabilitation or movement or understanding of their bodies, right? We're not just the earth suit that we exist in. We are the earth suit and how we perceive that earth suit in ourselves. We're not just the earth suit we exist in. We're the earth suit and how other people think our earth suit should exist. Mm -hmm. And how that dialogue between other people and yourself changes how you perceive that entire environment. So mm -hmm. it's this really nuanced interplay of people that, of the ways others think about you, the way you think about yourself, and the way your body tells you it should be thinking, right? Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there's a relationship between, so I, I totally agree with everything you just yeah, said. No, you're good. You're good. I want to, I want to play devil's advocate for just a no, second. Go for it. Could there be an issue with, if someone were to tell you that they are, they have pain, I have, yeah. I have pain and you mm -hmm. say, oh, so you're experiencing pain Yeah. and they immediately get on the defensive and say, no, I have pain because potentially in that yeah. psycho, mm -hmm. psychosocial. Bio psychosocial model, they, mm -hmm have experience on the social side that people will discredit their pain or discredit their experience. Yeah. And so when someone comes in and says, oh, so this is something you've experienced, it seems to be, as, as you said, it's something transient and therefore mm -hmm. not particularly real to some extent. It's something that obviously we're experiencing. It is very real, but it's not, it doesn't have as much weight as people might come in with it. Yeah. How, how would you, how do you deal with that? How do you approach that? And that's actually a huge piece of it. I've had dialogues with uh, clients and patients and things like that that are saying, hey, no, you, the way you're explaining this, it sounds like you're dis dismissing what I'm saying. Right. In no world amp are we dismissing what they're saying. Mm -hmm. It's addressing the fact that you are everything that they're experiencing is valid. The pain that they have, they're describing it as, is a valid, is a valid sensation. It's a huge piece of the education part of rehabilitation and um, bringing someone back to being able to live their life that you have to go through this very thorough dialogue and trust that other people know and understand how to, how these things, how these things interplay and trust and know that other people can understand the dialogues that you're presenting as a, from a scientific perspective or a psychological perspective. Um, often, especially in medical practices, people will assume that, or medical professionals will assume that individuals that they're working with don't under, won't understand what they're saying. Right. And it's not true. 
ultimately, like it's patently not true. I um, did a I did a lecture series online. It's on YouTube uh, through our physio our page about persistent pain and dial. Or it's about three four thirty minute lectures about these different aspects that I'm talking about right now, essentially. I'll, I'll link them in the bio. When this yeah, sweet, out. that'd be rad. Um, but ultimately, these four lectures, I sent them out, didn't get a huge following because it's again, small clinic, new space, but like my aunt and uncle who are like 75 and 80 have no medical background training and things like that. They're like, this is very approachable. This makes sense, like how our bodies, the, like to the point that I'm describing like cell structure and this is a nerve and how nerves conduct information and how nerves can become weird and send information in different ways. And this type of information, it's a building block on which you have to start, which is why taking, I'm giving you a kind of quick rundown about how these descriptions occur to say that someone's experiencing pain, you have to step back and go, okay, what do you know about pain? Right. Right. And then they often the dialogue is, I don't know. It's just something I have. They said, I get medication. They said it works and it feels okay for me. It's like, okay, but how does it happen in your body? What are you feeling when you experience pain? And then going through dialogues of does your pain change, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Does it change based on your tiredness? Does it change based on your emotions? Right. And taking this approach of really, looking at an experience or a sensation or a perception that we're feeling and parsing it apart and breaking it down. Um, there's a word that I use and it's used in the exact wrong conditions here um, from the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows mm -hmm. uh, called chirosclerosis. Um, it's a horrible word actually. It's the recognition of happiness in an environment. So you're happy at an event, you're happy because you saw something, you're happy because you did this art, but then your brain with its nature starting to take that happiness and parsing it apart. Well, why am I happy? Oh, it's because there's these people here and it's this and it's this and it's this and it's because I feel this or this previously happened until all you have is the bitter memory of that happiness and a lot of boxes, mm -hmm. right? In Beautiful the same put. way, it's a well, rough word, super savage word, mm -hmm. honestly, like and everyone does it at some point. Mm -hmm. um, would also recommend you link that, the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows, great place. Um, I, I but, absolutely love it. Yeah. Um, but in the same way that you can do it with happiness, you can do it with other experiences, right? Mm -hmm. You can do it with sadness. You can do it with anger. You can do it with jealousy. You can do it with pain. Pain takes a long time though. Often people who have persistent pain states need that time in order, in order to process the information and start to deconstruct the narratives that they present themselves, right? And once you're able to take that pain experience, that negative thing and put it into a lot of little boxes, suddenly that big thing that they had no definition for is a lot more defined and they can take and they can approach every piece as it may or as it presents. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's rad stuff. Yeah. It's super cool. Do you think that that's a large part? I would say it would, it would probably be um, underemphasized in terms of your practice of holistic physiotherapy. So mm -hmm. you being able to teach people about their bodies and things that actually help them get better themselves as opposed to coming in for a weekly massage. So you're yeah. teaching them exercises and going up the entire chain. I ran mm -hmm. into, I was supposed to be, when I first got here, my mom set up a physio date for me with a physio down the street. And I ran into her the other day and she was a little bit off put because I never ended up showing up. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. I, I, had to, I had to explain it to her. She thought it was, she felt really bad because she has a steep price and mm -hmm. she said that she never wanted that to be a reason that anyone didn't get medical help. And so yeah. I explained to her that it was something that I wanted to do was try to do the re the rehab by myself without a physiotherapist and just do the research and mm -hmm. try to do it all myself so that I could maybe pass that knowledge on to other people in the future and mm -hmm. let other people know that it's possible to do it themselves. I was thinking more about people in impoverished countries with no access to physiotherapists that yeah. one day experience uh, the, the, the kick in the back of the leg and then can't walk for several months. So yeah. that was my, that was my, so that was my, that was, that's what I told her. That's, that was yeah. my rationale behind that. And yeah. we talked about it a lot and she discussed people that come into physiotherapy and come from other physiotherapists that haven't worked and they come to her and she asks what they've been doing and she gets them to do a bunch of stuff that is in no way related at all to the injury itself. So yeah. in my experience, I think that, I think that if you do, if you rupture your Achilles, you're very likely to end up injuring a hamstring or anything in the posterior chain back of the leg. 
I think that's happened mm -hmm. to Boogie Cousins, Kevin Durant, lots of people that have come back from Achilles ruptures in the NBA in the past little bit. They've all had hamstring injuries, and I think that it's because of the lack of focus on the posterior chain. And yeah. so, not necessarily hamstring mm -hmm. injury, sorry, but it's no, in the, you, it's in the back you. of the leg, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so you, you do a very good job at, number one, explaining what's actually going on in someone's body so that they can have a right. holistic understanding of what's going on. And then you also give them the tools as opposed to just kind of giving yeah. them the, the rehab. Yeah. So there's a fun, um, you, as a practitioner, often we should be striving to give people an internal locus of control. Mm -hmm. We give them tools to allow them to move and allow them to rehab themselves, right? We come in with what we can, but it's on the onus of the individual to also come in and meet us where we are. Because if they don't do that, we can only do so much, right? Mm -hmm. And depending on the practice, right? Some people get tired, right? It's easy to throw on a TENS machine and heat and go have a good day, right? Or do some soft tissue work and be like, yeah, you're going to feel rough for the next couple of days, but ultimately things are going to get better. And there is a notion in any medical practice about the regression to the mean uh, as a principle from statistics. Yeah. Um, we all tend to get better roughly, right? Mm -hmm. And so we always have to be... Um, respectful of the regression to the mean and how much our actual impact is but ultimately if an individual is engaged in looking to feel or looking to find help and find a way to get back to doing living the life that they want to because ultimately the achilles injury is an injury right let's say you pulled like you you blew an achilles right mm -hmm. that's the tissue that's damaged but what is the thing that actually you want to get back to right mm -hmm. If you didn't get, if you don't get your injury back, if, if someone doesn't get their injury better, what can't you do that you would want to do? Right. Mm -hmm. That's always the question. Yeah. It's uh, and finding that drive for an individual is the probably the center point step that we should be striving for. Mm -hmm. Whether that's I want to get sure you want to get better at your golf game, but what does that actually mean? Well. If I get better at golf, it means I can spend more time with my grandson. Or if I get if I can't deal with this low back pain, I won't be able to pick up my daughter. Or I won't be able to do whatever. Right? It's mm -hmm. that finding that drive and that motivation is the piece that I think a lot of people have get tired or have a difficult time finding because it takes more than a analytical approach of oh you've ruptured your Achilles tendon that means your soleus and gastrocnemius possibly are compromised et cetera et cetera et cetera it's going what is the thing we need to move back to and how can we get you such that you are motivated to get back to that place mm -hmm. and that brings that other person to the to the bridge with you so you can help them to move forward. Yeah right? I know for me and then mm -hmm. sorry go ahead. Go. No, you go, you go, you're good. <laughs> uh, for me, it was playing volleyball again mm -hmm. the next season. And that's something that I've recently decided I'm not going to do. Yeah. I'm not going to go back and play. I'm going to try to do some stuff down here. Yeah. But that for me was the big lofty goal that I had set. And it was even mm -hmm. a recommendation I'd had from a physiotherapist. I, um, I knew the impact of having a big lofty goal and mm -hmm. uh, the relationship between the dopaminergic system and a big lofty goal. So that was something that I wanted to, to do. But she had told yeah. me that you, regardless of whether you're going to do the thing that you ended up getting injured doing, mm -hmm. you should have your goal is to get to the best possible shape that you can get yourself into. And then once you get there, then you can make an actual decision whether it's something that you want to do or not. Yeah, right. And ultimately, getting back to volleyball, that's, an, that's a piece of your entire lived experience, right? Mm -hmm. That's a piece of your identity as a person, right? Yeah. To lose that destabilizes a large portion of things. So to have that as your goal is commendable. And it's a thing that you pushes you to get better and pushes mm -hmm. you to move through the rehabilitation process, the highs, the lows, often a lot of lows, uh, depending on how someone's going through things, right? Yeah. Um, but it's that thing. It's like, hey, how do I get back to doing this thing that I, I makes me who I am or lets me be who I want to be, mm -hmm. right? And that dialogue is such a, because often people come in, it's like, well, my back's sore. Why are you talking to me about my, you know, extended family? And you're like, yeah, it's a, and it's a weird conversation to have, honestly. Like, it's like, it feels so counterintuitive to what a physio, a traditional physiotherapist practice moves through, right? Mm -hmm. So it's something that I feel needs to be presented, not only in physiotherapy, but just in like medical practices and wellness practices more frequently 
-hmm. And it's one of the things that I think the alternative, like the alternative health community does a really good job exploring. It's giving, letting people have the space to tell their story and reflect on how they can get back to that story more than anything. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Well, it's very good at building community as well, which is mm -hmm. something that really helps to build resiliency. Yeah. And that's a big piece. Um, there was actually, I was reading some weird literature on running actually recently mm -hmm. or today about barefoot running, minimalist shoe running, yeah. and then the different ways that people run heel strike versus midfoot strike versus toe strike. So when you land, you can either land with your heel, the middle of your foot or your toes. Mm -hmm. And uh, midfoot and toe strike actually are oh, 2.7 times less likely to develop knee and hip injuries mm -hmm. than heel strike. Um, because heel strike puts so much force through your feet, through your tibia into your knee and your shoulder or knee and your hip. I'm using yep. my arm as an analog. It's fine. Um, that over time, these persistent, um, repetitive strain injuries can occur a lot more frequently. Most between, oh, what was it? Who 30 to 79% of runners every year experience some sort of running related injury. And possibly in this kind of vein, it might be related to shoes and the way that we run and the way that we actually move our bodies and put our feet through the ground. Um, I don't remember how this is related, especially to the point you were saying. There was a, there was a, there was a relationship. Community? Right. Community, right. Um, there was a study looking at rehab for Achilles, uh, ACL tears and um, Achilles tendinopathies. Mm -hmm. And if the rehab was performed in a group setting, people reported uh, better outcomes uh, better social, better socialization. Um, often they got better faster as well within a shorter period of time, because not only do they have um, an a social obligation to do the exercises as a group, they also have the motivation of others who are also going through the same process, right? Mm -hmm. It's the interplay of the two. And if someone's feeling down, often other people will help bring them up. Even if they're in the same space and other people are doing the exercise, we have an implicit social obligation in our brains to do, well, if other people are on the bike, I had better get on the bike, like yeah. kind of thing, right? It's those silly psychological studies where they have an office and the, and the bell rings and everyone else stands up except the one person and then sits back down, right? <laughs> yeah. We, the same thing can happen with rehab, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's funny, it's interesting to talk about that community aspect, because it is, again, evidenced in the research and the literature that we currently have to say that these things do create a function and have a function in our days. I wonder what the, um, the impact of birth of ideas would be, because so for the, there are lots of message boards that okay. will share mm -hmm. ideas on how to speed up or how to optimize recovery. So I wonder... Mm -hmm by getting people into close knit groups where everyone's experiencing the same thing, mm -hmm. how, how many ideas come to flourish in between people just mm -hmm. discussing it saying, Oh, yeah. I massage this area. I, I do this, I do that. Yeah. And then that create, that just allows people to streamline mm -hmm. what works the best. And then yeah. everyone moves forward at a faster rate. Mm -hmm. And that's actually kind of an interesting aspect. There's a double edged sword with that type of stuff because often um, red herrings can appear on those type of environments too. Right. Or things that are like, hey, I do this specific esoteric exercise and it works really well for me. And the specific esoteric exercise might not be at all related to the injury, but in doing the exercise ritualistically and believing that you're doing the exercise that is helpful, mm -hmm. it's kind of ultimately going to be helpful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. As long as you're doing the other stuff that is useful as well, those occasional little extraneous ones that are a little bit, a little bit out there, a little bit off kilter mm -hmm. or off the typical pattern or a pattern that is useful aren't a problem. Yeah. Um, and collaboration in those environments can be helpful for people who are stuck as well, right? Mm -hmm. An individual who's stymied in their healing or having a struggling through a certain area, often having a dialogue with both other medical professionals and also um, other people that have had the injury can be vastly helpful because someone might come forward and say, hey, I saw this one weird thing online that worked for me or hey, I tried this random thing from this person that I was talking to that worked out really well. And just that transfer of knowledge and information from lived experience, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think that's something that's missing in the Western world as an individualist society in a larger scale. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, that individualism validates a lot of things like freedom and individual ability to move and uh, explore their own lived experience, but it doesn't give space to collaborate. Mm -hmm. It has a harder time um, trying to find ways that we reflect on the community, reflect in a community sense and build communities and build communities in healthy ways. Because often people are so, it's 
so ingrained in us to be competing through all of through all of our undergraduate schooling and schooling in general yeah. it is a competition right we set yeah. it as a competition it is a numbers based game it is who is at the top who is at the bottom why are people doing poorly why are people doing great and i understand the merits of um needing a system to figure out where people are because if you don't have that type of thing how do you know how someone's doing well necessarily but well is again set by society and that's a whole other argument you can talk about as well mm -hmm. um but in the health context it's not something that's a competition it never is and that's <laughs> tangenting out that's why i like things like yoga and other wellness practices and even i've gotten into rock climbing really frequently recently mm -hmm. it's not a practice of competition right you're not fighting other people to do all the routes. You're fighting, you're battling yourself and you're collaborating with other people to figure out how to do the things that you want to do, right? Mm -hmm. So it's working together to solve a problem on the wall or it's working together in a yoga studio to say, hey, I have these movements that I can do. Here's some alternatives and options. What works for your individual body and what can we as the community share to allow you to try that kind of thing, mm -hmm. right? And I think I've been trying to eventually when this pandemic chills out and we can actually have in-person classes again i want to be able to offer spaces like that that allow people to explore movement in a healthy way and in a way that allows them to collaborate with a circle of individuals and go hey how do we move how can we move in a different way and have a discussion an active discussion about movement and ability to get back to moving in the lives they went or lives they live mm -hmm. <sighs> it's a lot <laughs> very well put yeah. Uh, to segue into something else that's yes. intangibly, uh, you'd say intangibly graded, maybe. Uh, sure. How did you get into art? And oh boy, um, yeah. big question. Uh, I've been. I think I've doodled since infancy. Didn't really stop. My parents just kind of said, "Yeah, he likes to draw, draw stuff," kind of thing. Um, all through high school, uh, I did. I've always done it intermittently in the background, um, just as a hobby more than anything. Uh, really in university was when I started digging into drawing a lot, um, both due to just the neat necessity to, because often we had to do scientific illustration or drawings for classes and things like that, but also due to, I had one professor that was at Thompson Rivers University, um, one of our botany profs, spectacular woman, um, but she uh, loved marrying the mixture of arts and sciences together very specifically. So she taught us how about scientific illustration. She does field journaling, which is this really beautiful mixture of like academic work and also the subjective experience of the environment. So it'll be mixtures of field notes of the animals and species, animals and plants that you see, the friends that you see in the environment, the weather that you're seeing, but also the feelings you've had. Right. You can have these blurbs about I saw this particular color. It was an azalurian crimson. It was a whatever. It made me feel this. It made me feel this. It's a picture that you've drawn of a small bird doing one thing or it's a dead flower that you found that you thought was really interesting. It's this and it's blending in all of these pieces and integrating those two, those kind of unifying those two practices of the subjective experience of art and lived life and being able to portray it on a page as well as having that academic spin of saying, this is the world as it is, but the world as it is, is beautiful. Mm -hmm. So I've always kind of played with, I've, the way I've gotten into it more frequently has been taking that juxtaposition or taking that patterning and just starting to put it on a page. Yeah. Whether that's the scientific illustration that I present on my social media, whether that's some of the abstraction I've used from cultural things, mandala patterns, uh, different motifs, abstract or abstract art based on different culture, cultural patterns, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's an expression of existence that I kind of just got into. And it really solidified with art when I was in the UK because we had these weird blocks of time. Um, for some reason, our program had Wednesdays off. Don't ask how. Um, we just did, um, but I'd spend half the day studying and the other half I'd spend like three and a half hours in a coffee shop that was on the corner um, with all window wall or two walls that were all windows. And I'd sit and just doodle and like listen to music and just watch people flow by and just scribble on a page and see what came out. It didn't matter what it was. And often that experience and the interactions that experience created really drove me to keep doing more than anything. Mm -hmm. It was a really funny I just the one time I remember there was a very specific instance I was sitting drawing abstract just something that's 
has no meaning particularly to me. It's just a doodle on a page. I was using reds and oranges. It was this kind of flourished smudge, like what have you. And this is part of that subjectivity and that we've touched, touched on those kind of internal dialogues that affect our thoughts, feelings, and emotions from pain, but also in other environments. So sitting drawing and this woman walks over and she's like, oh, what are you drawing? That's really pretty. And I'm like, well, what do you think it is? <laughs> and she goes, oh, uh, I hadn't thought about it. I'm like, I have no objective with this drawing. What do you think it is? She's like, I see a lot of anger. And I'm like, well, why do you see anger? That seems like a very specific emotion. I had no objection or like projection in this drawing. I was just putting paint to a page. And she's like, well, that's a good question. We sat down and talked for three and a half hours. I learned so much about this woman and her lived experience through the lens of this stupid nonsense painting that I made just mm -hmm. for the sake of it and just for the sake of doing something with art. And it was that, it's that kind of piece of everyone being able to see something out of a, out of a medium in different ways that really continues to drive that kind of dialogue in the back of my head. I think that's where we're at. I was going to say you're going to have to be very you're going to have to be very careful around the psychoanalytics if you're doing a uh... yeah of course <laughs> of course yeah that's really funny mm -hmm. I I do remember a project in one of my personality classes where our mm -hmm. professor put up an image on the whiteboard and the image was yeah. of kids writing something and. She said, write a story about this. Sure. And my friend and I both wrote stories and they were drastically different, but it made me realize how we actually had definitely projected our experiences onto that drawing. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, mm -hmm. it is funny how we do that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that your experience with the fields, the fields, field journal? Field journaling, yeah. Okay, field journaling. Do you think that your experience with that impacted how you you do add a lot of flowers and mm -hmm. it's full of nature and oh, yeah. all of your art is mm -hmm. around there, there aren't any boxes there aren't any straight yeah. lines it's it's very very fluid it depends it depends on the dry but yes i got you mm -hmm. um a lot of the nature stuff ultimately it's because of my appreciation of nature um i've been the goofy i was the goofy kid that ran and chased butterflies in the field when i was in grade school mm -hmm. like I've been the kid that digs around in the dirt. I would collect bugs. I've always collected bugs. And even through my undergraduate degree, despite being a physiotherapist, all of my undergrad was plant and fungal science. So like, it's never going to be something that I don't appreciate, mostly because it's, we, I think people devalue the existence of the world around us so frequently. And it is so profound in such a way that I think people don't realize. Um, again, hearkening back to my experience in the UK, you live in, I was living in a borough. It was the same set of brick houses, every direction, just the campus and like just the little downtown section. And everyone's like, this place is boring. It's always the same. Mm -hmm. And I had a hard time believing that because every day you'd walk outside, you'd see different rose bushes growing. You'd see different uh, oleander growing. You'd watch the moss sporangia forest coming up. You'd see different, the minutia of life holding on tenuously in an environment that is built for humans as a species was in and of itself fascinating. So even when I was in the UK, I would still draw plants and flowers and juxtapose them against these concrete backgrounds or juxtapose them against these old postcards that existed 150 years ago or 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, because it was a, it was a fun, for more than anything, it looked pretty. Um, but ultimate, But also because it allowed you to kind of I guess in a way, put take that individuality and that beauty, that thing you see all the time, even if everything else looks broadly similar, and place it on something that is kind of symbolizing that, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. The postcard being the monotony or the similarity of an environment, the concreteness of human spaces that we think is concrete, but then having something new or blossoming or growing out of that place that is so organic, chaotic, mm -hmm beautifully chaotic, cacophonic, something like that. Um, the way you describe it makes me think of the blade of grass or the flower that ends up making its way through the dense concrete yeah. and lives through the crack. Mm -hmm. it's, the dan it's the dandelion that's desperately clinging to the stone brickwork on the wall. Mm -hmm. Like It's that sort of thing, right? And it's that tenaciousness of existence and the tenaciousness of life that is just inherently beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I think you can never 
you can't really go wrong with adding it in a as a motif to something. Um, I've started following, and in the same vein, I've started following a lot of artists who do what is effectively scientific illustration, but add in these surrealist blends and surrealist cues. Um, there's one, and she has these pictures of like, it'll be a like, what was it? A blue heron ripping apart a snake that is biting itself, and then flowers are exploding out of wounds, and all this kind of mixture of things. And it's just these. It's like ta it's that mixture of taking reality and then just twisting it just so that I feel like is really cool out of that environment specifically and using nature, something that we take so for granted to spin those lenses across that I find really fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought that in, in Denmark, they did a really good job at incorporating nature into the, what was the concrete jungle. So mm -hmm. between houses there were always these green belts so basically in your backyard you had a small forest that you could go and explore oh, and, and that was just everywhere they did such yeah. an unbelievable job at that throughout the city and it made you feel as if you were really in a small town i yeah i was just outside of copenhagen and oh my god yeah and it, it didn't feel as though i was in a metropolis which mm. copenhagen is it was yeah. every like i said i could i could go my back door and i was in mm. a shoddy apartment building in the ghetto and yeah there was this huge green space and there was yeah. a, a river flowing through and the, the ocean was right there. Mm -hmm. And it was, I thought that they did a very good job at incorporating nature into mm -hmm. the urban jungle in a way that made you feel far more free than you really were and free, mm -hmm. not in the, yeah. not in the sense of being imprisoned yeah. by anything, but in, mm -hmm. in another way you, you were imprisoned. You, we yeah. do feel that way when we're bogged down by buildings on every which way without seeing mm -hmm. grass for, six months of the year and you only yeah. get to see it when you leave the town. So I thought yeah. they did a good job at incorporating that. And I wonder how mm -hmm. much of that is at play for their happiness index as well. Yeah. I probably a fair bit, the, like the claustrophobia of a large city that occurs when you don't have the opportunity of green spaces that are not perfectly maintained. If there mm -hmm. aren't those kind of environments, those kind of in between like kind of liminal in liminal nature spaces, it gets very tiring in some ways. As much as I like, as much as I've hearkened about the beauty of the smallness of things, I had to learn how to do that after mm -hmm. over a time. Because I'm from BC, we're in the interior. You literally walk out your back door and you're like, there's a mountain. I'm gonna go hike it. It's yeah. gonna be woodlands. It's gonna be great, right? When I started in London, I had those kind of initial thoughts of like, oh my God, this is the same place all the time. There's nothing green. Or if there is things that are green, they've been placed intentionally by human hands. Mm -hmm. Like, and it gets tiring until you start seeing those little bits or like the oh, most ragged looking fox like I had ever seen rolled across. They're like, someone said, we have foxes downtown London. And I'm like, you have foxes in this city? And I saw one and I'm like, that is the most dangerous looking fox I have ever seen. <laughs> but like ultimately, mouth. oh yeah, foaming at the mouth, like scraggly looking, like looked at me across the street, hissed and ran <laughs> away kind of thing. Like hilarious. But to see that we have that little bit of that chaos still, even in a concrete jungle is so important. And I think due to that, lack of education and lack of understanding of the nature that we live with those concrete jungles get very claustrophobic because mm -hmm. it's always the same steel streets it's the same concrete buildings it's the same glass and glass and metal it's the same rumbling of the tube it's it's just humans mm -hmm. it's very totalitarian it, right it's very totalitarian it's very like insular in a certain way because the only experience that you get to learn about is other human experience mm -hmm. like you can go to green park but that is green lawn green park is green lawn that's all it is it's a big lawn with some trees around the edge of it that have been placed intentionally yeah. right and ultimately it's not there to experience the park it's there to socialize on a lawn <laughs> like or like walk around the lawn or what have you. There were there are some beautiful gardens, let me be clear. There are some mm -hmm. spectacular floral arrangements and things like that. But again, they're placed such that they are for human experience and human consumption. It's not like us walking into the woods, which isn't placed for human consumption. Mm -hmm. It's placed for, it's, it's there intrinsically for itself, right? It's not used, it's not there at the beck and call of man or beck and call of the human species on the earth. And that kind of difference between those two spaces I found was really jarring and odds are probably impacted a lot of people. 
uh, mm -hmm. especially in London. People get people were very, in a lot of ways, um, living in their own bubble. Right? You live in your you live in your machine. You don't you like you don't bother dealing with other people because you are having to get back and forth from work. You're living the rat race essentially, mm -hmm. um, which is liberating in some ways because no one cares what you do. Mm -hmm. But also, no one cares what you do. Yeah. And there's no implicit like interaction or that community that can be built really quickly without like battling to get into that community because everyone is in these circles or these tiny spheres of lived existence in a human environment, a human built environment. Mm -hmm. why, why, do you, yeah, why do you think that we strive to find and also create beauty? I, I've read a book recently. I've read a couple of books by Steve Pinkner recently. And I'll give you time okay. to think about it while I explain this. So mm -hmm. the, these books by Steve Pinkner, one of them was The Language Instinct and the other one was How the Mind Works. And towards the end of the book, he gave two, he gave a few chapters and they were more, they, they seemed to be write-offs for mm -hmm. uh, spirituality and religion and art and beauty. And the way that he explained it was a spandrel. And so a spandrel is something that is the consequence of a creation. So yeah. on an archway, yeah, 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 yeah. okay, the yeah, there's a little hole. There's, yeah, right. there's a little top and, and you can put art onto that and the, that thing evolves because of the, the archway itself. Another example, mm -hmm. of, a few other examples of that would be in Russia, they were, there was a, a dog breed, uh, he, was a, he was a fox breeder and he was trying yep. to breed the, the, these coats of this particular fox. And to do that, it was a lot easier for him to selectively breed the dogs in a way that would make them more friendly to each other and also humans and yeah over time that resulted in these foxes that look like puppies essentially yeah and they're adorable i've seen yeah them. yeah so and then also i'm getting i'm getting this one from no, robert Sapolsky. You're good, you're good. and then in i want to say again it was russian tubes in the russian tubes so the russian russian metro there were dogs that became more and more uh, non-domesticated so yeah. more and more vicious to humans and they ended up looking like wolves and so these seem to be spandrels that relate to each other in the sense that if you want a dog to be nice it's going to be much cuter and if you want a dog to be mean it's going to look a lot more vicious and in that sense mm -hmm. how wh why do we why do we find things beautiful why do we find beauty in things why is there a, a drive to as you've said, find chaos in things and, and use that chaos to create and to explore our own minds. Yeah. It seems like something that could be potentially gratuitous if you create too much chaos. Obviously, you can create too much yeah. chaos and mm -hmm. break down a system, but mm -hmm. to have everything in order and mm -hmm. have a totalitarian regime yeah. around order and around the, the beauty that we create, mm -hmm. it seems to be, I, I really like the way that Alan Watts put it, was that if you, if you dream a dream that you have control over, then over time you want to dream that dream less and you want less and less and less control until yeah. you finally forget that you're dreaming. And that's the idea of the, the Brahma Yama or the, yeah. the Brahma Maya. And okay. the, we're all a, a part of a God that mm -hmm. doesn't know that it's all part of one thing and we're all yeah. actors in a play. Yeah. It's the, yeah, it's the Brahman, the Brahman and the veil of Maya and the fractionating yes. of existence and how we are all reflections of the self exploring itself because why not? Exactly. Right. right. It's and like, I think that's a really profound aspect of existence. And I think beauty might be a reflection of that like chaotic interplay, right? Mm -hmm. uh, perfect uniformity is a blank slate and our brain, I love, um, my friend likes to call our brains, um, electric soup. Mm -hmm. Um, and ultimately it is an, like to discuss what even the idea of consciousness is, is probably beyond the scope of what I understand, mm -hmm. but the emergent property of random chaos in our brains and electricity firing in different ways, force implicitly creates chaotic patterns or fractal patterns. Um, there's a really cool book I'm reading about chaos theory, essentially. It's mm -hmm. by, oh God, I don't remember who it's by, but it was recommended by Robert Sapolsky, the gentleman that wrote Behave. Yep. Um, fantastic book. He touches on uh, spandrels as well in one of his lectures he does, um, but talking evolutionarily of um, the chin, actually, mm -hmm. which is a spandrel in human faces because it's a, um, we have a certain length of jaw required in order for us to actually be able to chew. Yep. And without muzzles, there's a certain threshold length that this point and protrusion will exist because we need all the musculature to make sure the jaw still functions. 
Mm. So our chins in and of themselves are vestigial or like a spandrel feature due to the fact that our muzzles retracted down to the face length or face level and allows yeah. ourselves to have this planar face. Um, there's a lot of evolutionary adaptationists that would say, oh, it's a feature to allow for, it's been sexually selected for, it's this, that, the other thing. And it doesn't seem to be, it doesn't follow any of the rules of anything that we do. And so ultimately they get, think it's one of these kind of vestigial features that exists kind of spuriously. In the same way that I think beauty has that kind of almost spandrel aspect. It's something that breaks the mold or ha if there's uniformity, we're going to create some sort of disorder in order to draw visual focus or create a visual aesthetic of sorts. I have a really hard time to, oh, hello, aren't yeah. you adorable? Look at this guy. Oh. He gets oh, all mad buddy. if I don't let him up. <laughs> um, it's hard. I, beauty is such a weird concept to me because I don't, I, is there like a psychological or a, like a physiological or a like mental construct that is more than social that beauty is derived from? Because like, what is to describe what is beauty in like a definition term definitional term to to address that first question i would yeah. say that maybe religious experience would be associated mm -hmm. with beauty so something that i experience when i look at beautiful things and mm -hmm. particularly art is inferior yeah and there's some there's something about that and it's not only you can you can look at it two ways essentially mm -hmm. you could you could look at it as a pushing or a pulling figure so in the in the the pushing way it's inferiority and it tells mm -hmm. you that you're not as good as the thing you're seeing exactly it, it's mm -hmm. there's there's nothing in the world that's more valuable than art and that's okay. from a and that's that's lit like from a i'm, I'm saying that literally yeah uh, the most expensive pieces of fabric in the entire world are art there yeah. are museums that contain billions and billions of dollars worth of this thing that's yeah. essentially mm. uh, a pigment on a white canvas. Yeah. And so it is invaluable in that sense. And the other sense is that I, I would say the pulling factor is that it, it gives you an inkling of what you could maybe be. Mm. So mm. I think mm. that that's the, it's, I think art lets us tap into what Carl Jung would considered to be the anima or the animus is the okay. unconscious mechanism outside of ourselves that so for for males it's uh, a female entity and for females it's a male entity and i yeah. think that that's a in in some way trying to find a way to integrate the female and the male in the individual yeah. and mm -hmm. i think that that's what beauty does and what art does is mm -hmm. it allows us to create an idea in our mind of what we could be Sure. And yeah. and it, it does give us some some religious experience. You could mm -hmm. stand in front of a, a piece of art for hours on end and look at every single piece of it. And then mm -hmm. the, the so the way that the way the Pinkner explained it was that in the there are there are common motifs in art that tend to be successful in creating mm -hmm. or uh, or calling people in. So one of that could be and I th I think a lot of it's actually associated with the hero's journey. So mm -hmm there are hills and pathways that lead to something that's unexplored and this territory that could be something more than what we are right now. So mm -hmm. my, a friend of mine has this really beautiful painting that he got from Goodwill. I think it was like $5, but he just loves yeah, it. Yeah. Love those. It's, They're great. It's a uh, Harbor and in the Harbor, it's rainy and dark and cloudy and going out of the Harbor, it looks, it looks like the harbor in Lord of the Rings where mm. there's this beautiful light shining yeah. down and it's this beckoning for exploration, a mm -hmm. call to do something greater. It's the call to yeah. the, this journey outside of ourselves. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's what Pinkner thought. And Jane Goodall had this cool finding. I think this, this friend told me about this. It was that he was reading a national geographic and she said that in 10 years, we're going to find something very cool about chimps or within 10 years, she was mm -hmm. just hypothesizing that we're going to understand their psyche a little bit better. And I think it was 30 years later, this group were able to watch a, a chimp tribe find a waterfall and they all started dancing around in a circle and they just had a great time. And I think that that's a, I think that that's another type of religious experience is actually finding yeah. the thing. So 
there's mm -hmm. both the aspect of searching for the thing or being aware that mm -hmm. the thing outside of yourself that you could achieve exists as well as when you've actually achieved that thing. And I, I think that's maybe a pull to actually creating art mm -hmm. is the action of creating something and seeing what you have created. And even that yeah. is, I'm not, I'm not sure about you, but whenever I've done painting and put paint to brush uh, or paint to brush to canvas, mm -hmm. I always find at the end that I have all of these nitpicky, sorry, one second, let me let this go. No, you're good, you're good. He, he gets so fidgety. Um, <laughs> we, so we, anytime that I've actually tried my hand at brush to canvas, yeah. I always find at the end that there are so many things that I could have done better and if I go back and try to fix all of them, I'll drive myself crazy. And so I have yeah. to just allow it to be as it is, as imperfectly perfect as it is. And mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis, he had a really good analogy about uh, painting in a canvas being ourselves. And mm -hmm. the more detail that, so he, his idea was that a canvas is a conscious entity that is us and can feel things. And so the more detailed that you go with the brush, the more painful it is to the canvas, but that that allows you to flesh out and create detail and mm -hmm. beauty in that detail. And so that was a little bit of a rant, but. No, it's good, you're good. I'm aimless, it, it, rants are always appreciated. Yeah. Um, I think, especially with art um, and the kind of principle of beauty, I think the thing that I really draw to is art and creation and like, expression is like in any way someone can express themselves you can people think science is sterile right but if you read some literature you can find the impassioned works of you're fine you're reading the impassioned works of an exhausted phd student or uh you know excited researcher or a fascinated postdoc or what have you evoked in such a way that they have to they're filtering creativity through a lens, the lens of academia mm -hmm. in the same way that someone can be a writer and write fan fiction. They're still a writer and it's an expression of their own internal dialogue. And they're trying to present it in a way such that other people can appreciate that expression. And what I find profound about art and the art like expression in that way is that it is in and itself a projection of your internal dialogue that doesn't, you can't evoke effectively to another individual. Language in and of itself is limited such that we have certain words that have certain meanings that ultimately are blended or mixed based on the other person's lived experiences of those words. To use art in that same way, we can try in a different mo medium to project our, or to reflect on our reality and let offer our reality to other people mm -hmm. and offer it in a way such that Hopefully they explain it. It's understand understood in a way that doesn't require language yeah. or evokes feeling or emotion or context, or if it's grounded in language, how the nuance of that language shifts and changes based on the way someone else writes or based on the way that they're seeing things and what, what they see is important. Um, a friend of mine tangentially related, but also related, we were talking about the nature of maps and cartography. Mm -hmm. And cartography is a really, I didn't, wasn't very aware of it until this point. Um, cartography is not only a description of a place, it's a description of the map maker. It's a description of the map maker's culture. Mm -hmm. It's a description of what the map maker thinks is the most important things in a world. And in that, in and of itself, makes maps so much more meaningful and like, profound in the same way that someone's painting of the skyline and so in that same way as I was saying um, that a map can be a reflection of the dialogues and things that someone someone values art can be the same way right if someone it can be as silly as a doodle on the side of a page right it can be as involved as the starry night by Van Gogh or whatever or Van Gogh or whatever it might that is Van Gogh right Starry Night. Yes, I think that's right. I'm horrible with names and people and artists and things like that. You pronounce um, it right, though. Yeah, I know. It's the weird phlegm. There's a weird phlegm on the end. I knew that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, but um, those are all reflections or projections of someone's internal dialogue into a different medium. Mm -hmm. And by using a different medium, I think that 
gives us the ability to at least shift the interpretation away from the linguistic interpretation. Mm -hmm. We'll all ultimately be constrained by the languages that we speak and the experiences that we have because we don't have other ways to explain things. Yeah. Um, but by using a different medium, it allows us to play with those tenuous edges of language and shift outside of those boxes and frameworks that we use to describe reality, mm -hmm. right? So as I've continued to do art and explore what it means to have a beautiful drawing and what have you, it's I've begun to appreciate the things that are less typified or less socially normal or less socially typical as art. Um, the strange eclectic drawings of a gentleman I follow. He's actually, he's in Salmon Arm, um, not too far from here. He's a bit of a counterculture individual, very individ very cool fellow, but he draws these like eccentric characters and caricatures and like it's all this very stretched and fluid dynamic stuff. And three years ago, I probably wouldn't have appreciated it in the mm -hmm. same way that I do now, because ultimately now it tells me more, it gives me an inkling about what he appreciates as a lived experience, the dynamism of an individual, the shape language of the shape language of existence, the like minutia of seeing what something is doing and not what something is, right? Mm -hmm. In and having those type of observations in art and in translation in a different form of translation than just writing words or speaking to someone. I think that's what I find profound about art in and of itself. Yeah. And what's beautiful about it too. So that was another thing that Steve Finkner touched on was the idea that we are confined by our language in describing mm -hmm. things. And some languages have particular words that are very useful and often get picked up very quickly by the, the lingua franca. Yeah. And one of those being a, a Schadenfreude, which yeah. is a, the, right, the German word for the mm -hmm. enjoyment that you feel at seeing someone yeah. that you dislike experience some kind of suffering. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. so when if if like when you say that to someone and they they haven't heard that word before they understand it immediately yeah. and it's an emotion that we feel and it can't be explained through words besides there there is yeah. there aren't particular words for every experience yeah. that we have and so he he discussed the idea of mentalies and that being the internal language that we have that's associated very it's i would say that it has some kind of synesthetic element to it oh, okay yeah you you feel something and you mm -hmm. kind of there's some kind of color associated to it yeah or and anything along those lines so the the, the combination so of I'm just playing with one okay the combination of all of these different sensory factors put together that looks good that's better i think <laughs> that sorry. might be the best lighting we've had all day <laughs> i know i'm so sorry i should no have no no that's fine <laughs> that looks good um yeah it's, so the the blending of all of these different sensory elements and all mm -hmm. of that combining into an internal language that we have for ourselves. And a lot of that comes out in, oh, you'll never understand. I can't explain it to you. And that, yeah. and that is really what we feel from art. Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen art that brings a tear to my eye and yeah. I wish I could explain the actual feeling of that, mm -hmm. but you can't. And you, you do put it at a really, you put it very well that it's almost a dialogue between the observer and himself through mm. the means of a painting and also yeah. obviously the the artists themselves have an impact on that creation but when i look at a piece of art i'm seeing it differently than the creator sees the piece of art mm. and that creates a dialogue with myself and that can also create a dialogue with other people we can all look at the same thing and see something different and each of us exactly. pull something out of that mm. and it's often the thing that we find the most beautiful yeah and there's something to be said about like <sighs> the the difficulty as well, in the same way that it is difficult to explain things to other people and explain things linguistically, it is, it is just as hard to evoke. It's learning a new, it's, it's learning a new language with the hands. Mm -hmm. um, and whichever medium you might use, if that's music, if that's writing, if that's art, if that's uh, sculpture, if that's scientific literature, if whatever it is, there's that aspect of language that we need to learn a new language to explain and evoke in a different medium. Um, there's a gentleman actually speaking of um, talking about language and the idea of we can't explore outside of our linguistic bubble. We can't explain to others those feelings. Um, there's a gentleman named Hilary Lawson. Um, he's a philosopher out of, I think, Cambridge University. I'm not exactly sure. Really interesting lectures. I found him on the, there's a podcast called, oh God, 
um, at philosophy for our times. And they have, they do like debates and stuff like that. Really good. He has a couple books out and he talks about um, language in this concept of closures. Um, and existence, our reality, is this idea of openness. Mm -hmm. To say that anything is one specific thing is a fallacy Lingu linguistically. A chair is also a bench, is also a stool, is also kindling, is also whatever all these things, right? Linguistically, we can put something in so many boxes that it begins to lose meaning. But all of those boxes that we create are different tools or closures around that openness that is this object that we see. And it, language needs to be mutable and needs to be able to change such that we can create new closures to explain things that are difficult or abstract or concrete or depending on which way it is. Mm -hmm. So he talks about a lot about like the language of nature and the language of science and can we explain things outside of our own purview and what happens when we start learning things that fall outside of our linguistic bubble, right? Um, to say we had words for quarks and strings and up charm and down charm and all these different physics principles, we had to make those up. Like, mm -hmm. and that process of making new language is so, is surreal. It is strange. It is social. It is, but it's something that, is a lot more difficult than I think people imagine in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, but it's something that is commendable to do and something that I feel a lot of communities strive to explore in, in different ways, in different environments, right? Um, again, hearkening back to the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows is a word that I've heard thrown around. I think I'm one of the only people that uses it, but other people I have heard use it, it's Sonder. Um, uh, the realization so Sonder's every from his person. book. Really? Yeah, if memory serves, he's the one, uh, it's from, I might be from his website, it might be from another place, but it's that idea that you are a background character in someone else's complex story, just mm -hmm. as complex as your own internal, internal life and lived experience. Everyone that you walk by has just as complex a life. Yeah. And that's both melancholic in the sense that, oh my God, I am, I am so small in the scale, but also in some ways, I find it like <sighs> wholesome. Mm -hmm. charming to be the character in the background of someone else's story drinking tea yeah. or looking out a window or with their headphones in as they walk by as they have something happen there's something delightfully vulnerable mm, not vulnerable again the, what word is there for me to explain this concept of profoundness almost mm -hmm. Uh, to, to have someone else's lived experience be just affected for a moment by your existence or to in that moment of existence seeing someone else's lived experience just as complex as yours flash and then disappear right mm -hmm. and to have and that's a word that didn't really exist until the last decade maybe or so yeah. And, but that word took time to build and it's a concept that people had to come together with and go, hey, we all feel this weird thing. What is it? What does it mean? How do we explain it? What is, how do we explain it with the language we have or do we need the language we have to explain it, right? Mm -hmm. Can we just say the word and go, I just experienced it. And it's like, well, what were you doing? And you said, well, did you not see it? And you pointed this object or you pointed this experience It's just complex. It's very cool and just super, super great to have that playing in that liminal space of not knowing where language will go, right? And it changes the way that we think as well. Mm. On on your example of Saunders, the mm. the realization that every single person has life as intricate and complex as your own. I think that aids in developing empathy for people a lot of yeah. the time, because mm -hmm. any confrontation that you have with someone, me me personally, I'll speak on personal terms, but any yeah. any confrontation that I have with people. I'm always humbled by the awareness that they have had a life just like I have. And yeah. they're, they're no worse or better for having lived that life, but they're just a part of their character in, in my life. And I'm equally a character in their life. So changing that frame of perspective from being the main character to also being the background character or a mm -hmm. secondary character or an antagonist yeah. in some circumstances, I think mm -hmm. that that aids to developing a wider understanding of other people. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. It's to be humbled by that knowledge of understanding that you are not, you're the center stage of your own lived existence, but no one else's. Mm -hmm. 
right? And you can't force that onto someone else. You can't say, no, I'm going to be your center stage. That's not fair. That's not fair to someone's lived experience. That's not fair to someone's ability to exist on a rock floating through space for a period of time. Yeah. Like it's to say that someone else's experience is invalid because my experience isn't the same, isn't fair at all in that context. Um, there's a, what was the other thing? Um, there's a, in that same lens and the ability to recognize that we can be secondary characters and everyone else lives as complex lives. Often, um, who was it? There's a psychologist that discusses this idea of um, the moral weight of actions and whether, whether or not you're doing it or someone else is doing it. If you do something that you consider immoral, it is an action of circumstance. I, mm. I had to do this because right. I couldn't make ends meet. I couldn't do this other thing. But if someone else does that same action, it's a moral judgment. Mm -hmm. For you, it's a circumstantial judgment. Often for other, when, you, when someone describes another individual doing that same action, it will be a moral judgment. Right, it's they're doing that because they're bad yeah. or because they're a bad person or X, Y, or Z. Whereas if you were in the same circumstance, you likely would do the same thing but you'd say, oh, I was just trying to make ends meet, or mm -hmm. I didn't know what else I could do. I didn't know there were other avenues, mm -hmm. right? So it's that to have words like sonder and to be able to explore that space of humility in the context of existence. Language, there are pieces of language that we need to learn and explore in order to bring us into that space of understanding others and creating that empathy between individuals. And I think right now we're lacking a lot of that. <laughs> I would some, agree. There's some sus suspect stuff going on in the world and it's hard to watch. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's, um, it's a good space and like, it's a really cool place to have that ability to, to have those dialogues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one, one more thing that I wanted to touch yeah. on briefly was you had discussed it a little bit earlier. One sec, let me, let me let my nope, dog back good. in. <laughs> <laughs> back and forth, back and forth. Sorry. No, you're fine. Don't worry. Um, yeah. Okay, so the, so I wanted to ask about the, what you think of the intersectionality between philosophy and science. The, I, so, so let me, let me, yeah, go ahead. let me, let me make a stage really quick. Yep. The, you could say old time scientists, so Einstein, Oppenheimer, uh, the, the old late greats, Oppenheimer was a, he had a really deep study into Hindu philosophy and yeah. there's this beautifully chilling, I wouldn't maybe say beautifully, but it is very chilling. It's a video of him after the completion of the Manhattan Project where he, mm -hmm. he quotes uh, a Hindu philosophy script. I can't remember what it was called. And he said that they had become. Oh, I think I know the one. Yeah, uh, I, I want to get it right, but I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to ruin it. Um, but he essentially he said that I am become death, destroyer of worlds. Yeah, and and all all of those old time scientists were very big into philosophy, and that was an integral part of the creation of their science was the understanding mm -hmm. of the philosophy and the science, and it was a marriage between those two that resulted in their their product, and yeah. that seems to be something that's been more and more spread apart. apart. Yeah. So another another thing is the the large leaps that any particular discipline has tends to be at the intersection of that discipline and another one. So when neuroscientists meet botanists and arborists and all of these different areas culminate into one thing that ends up being a somewhat new thing and I think that you are in that intersectionality of being someone who's deep into science and also being deep into philosophy and naturalistic art and all of these other areas and so I, I really think that all of those things coming together it's something that uh, W.E.B. Du Bois talks about a lot in his, his book The Soul of Black Folks where he says that people shouldn't be trained in university to perform a singular task, but we should be learning philosophy as well as the discipline of our choice. Yeah. Um, so I think there is, I find it frustrating that ironically enough in the UK and like the folk, the hyper-specialization that, that is required in a lot of schools 
there's a utility to it, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. We only have a certain amount. We're on a rock floating through space for a certain amount of time. We need to be able to do the thing we need to do. Um, in the current era, specialization is so important in an acad academic setting because it allows you to function in a very specific field. We have so much information now uh, out there that to be broadly cover or broadly covering that information requires like l a lifetime of dedication to even just knowing the baseline to understand all these different fields. Mm -hmm. And there is merit to understanding the specialization process. Uh, I have a friend who is a genius, frankly. Um, he's a botanist by training, but he's taken, he does molecular genetics. He does tax, he does taxonomy. He knows plant phylogenetics. He knows um, cell physiology. He's in the field of, he just like other PhDs and professors have described him as a like a Renaissance scientist, mm -hmm. which is something like Einstein and that like would be because they had the time and the space to diversify. There was an opportunity in that place because the fields were so new frequently that they could jump in and branch into other stuff. Right. Nowadays, it's a lot more difficult to do that because there's such a focus on output mm -hmm. and like the human centric utility of knowledge not just knowledge for the sake of it or the understanding of the environment in order to create his leaps and bounds often anything you do has to have a price tag on it what is this going to get us in the what is the output of this product what is the output of this product and there's i find it really hard to watch because it doesn't allow for these expansions and these intersections between groups because each group has become so insular. You have to become so hyper specialized within this field that to reach out into another field is so vast. The distance between them, despite their closeness, is so far such that it's impossible almost to reach into those places often. Mm -hmm. And to be able to play the line between, I think, in academia needs to be supported a lot more. Um, there's people like, it's always the frustration of undergraduates being like, why am I taking this course? I'm going to be a doctor. And you're like, no, <laughs> you need to understand that science is a, the, the understanding is a practice. It's not just an individual section. Mm -hmm. um, scientific philosophy in and of itself was based on the idea of, okay, we're going to ignore all of these extraneous factors that we don't understand. And we're going to explain this small piece of things. Ultimately, all these other factors still exist, but we don't know how to explain them yet. So we're just going to keep them to the side. Mm -hmm. And the reductionist approach of scientific practice creates so many divisions and there needs to be I think there needs to be that shift to bring that philosophy of um, it's not expansion, isn't like emergent property theory and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert Sapolsky puts it really well in some of his lectures and in his books, in his book, he talks about how often people describe things as these buckets and we have the bucket of neuroscience or the bucket of biology or the bucket, bucket of botany or the bucket of like Hindu philosophy or whichever ones they are. Right. And people keep them all separate. And ultimately what we need to do is let them overflow into each other in order to allow for that weird cacophonous mix in between to see what bubbles out because those are the places that we can create interesting stories or that we can explore interesting narratives and see how the world might function in a much more complex way than we think. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, if we, we're creating artificial boxes in science as a, as a practice itself, what happens if we break one of those boxes and fix it into another one? Um, chaos theory, I wish I was trying, that's what I was scrounging for. I can't find the book right now. Um, I could have swore it was here. I'm super mad about it. Um, but there's a, uh, chaos, a book on chaos theory. I'll see if I can link it to you after, sure. um, describing the history of chaos theory, essentially. And the original chaos theorists didn't know what they were talking about. They were like, what is this idea of fractals? Why are these patterns repeat suddenly becoming non-repetitive or non, non-pattern? when our current understanding of science says that if the inputs are the same, the output will always be the same. And there was like a group of the, one of the first scientists that was exploring chaos theory was a originally a geologist and then a statistician and an economist. And then he was like, Hey, physics is kind of cool. Let's try that out. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that anymore. You can't dab dabble so expansively in fields without people going, well, why aren't you going to specialize, right? Mm -hmm. And in doing that exploration of these different areas, he started looking at um, systems math and things like that. And he found these really interesting 
uh, physics-based principles with something as simple as like a water wheel and like the input of the water wheel versus the starting condition of where it was positioned in space and like the specific eddies in the current of the water causing the entire water wheel to perform chaotically and how in different inputs it would shift the way that the wheel would change but ultimately it would be chaotic. Um, and so he would publish these and this information was being presented, but they didn't have a language for it yet. And I think that we need to have these people that are testing these bounds in science and in the philosophy of science as a practice to bring the, to reduce that isolationism and that, set, uh, that insular nature of it to allow for those buckets to become instead, well, I don't know, planes that allow them to pour off of one another, right? Mm -hmm. And see how that interplay works. So. I think it's really important that we try to break down the um, almost elitism between circles mm -hmm. and allow people to have communication between a lot more. Um, there's a reason I love things like, you know, strange philosophies of other, of other cultures and talking to people that have these interesting worldviews and different dialogues because you can, no matter where you look, you can find parallels into your, one, into your own learned experience and also into the in different ways in which those fields or those under, modes of understanding can help guide your understanding or make it more nuanced and beautiful in its own way. Mm -hmm. Not up to you. I thought something very cool from the Sapolsky lectures was his way of describing each isolated block as a platform. And yeah. we're going to stand on this platform because that describes this idea the best. So let's say that you're trying to. For me, I'm, I'm training my dogs all the time yeah. to do fun tricks. And so yeah. I, could, I could explain that from a neuropsychological perspective, but that wouldn't make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Instead, I could approach it from a behaviorist perspective and talk about conditioning and how conditioning works and how I want to optimize the positive reinforcement and try to encourage some kind of superstitious learning so that they actually find the range of the activity that I'm trying to get them to do. and then. From there, we can aim more tightly, and yeah, exactly. Bring it in. We can rein. We can we can rein it in, and so I I think that another way that that ends up happening when we don't look at ideas as platforms to jump off of or uh, or disciplines, schools of thought, if we don't look at them as platforms and we start to look at them as boxes, then we often become dogmatic about them. I think isolation breeds dogmatism, so that's another thing that could be potentially very harmful and. Mm -hmm. um, I think I mean, it already is. It has been. Yeah, right? absolutely. Well, Things like um, phrenology and like the ideas of eugenics practices, right? Mm -hmm. They were an insular practice that was isolated in and of itself and built its own internal narrative such that it was allowed, or it was used as a tool to create segregation and discrimination against individuals, mm -hmm. people, whomever it was. You could, you could be typecast just because of the nature of this box that we created. Right. Even if the box didn't have didn't didn't hold any merit, and if someone else brought another box close by, it might have made more sense. Mm -hmm. But because that one had such a dogmatic approach and it was so large, prevented ability, prevented people from looking at it and from different angles and taking it apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a there's a podcaster that I really like. He, him and his wife are PhDs, and they they spend a lot of time breaking down scientific ideas. It's Brett Weinstein, and he talks about the the complex systems in relation to the COVID vaccine. And they look at it from the perspective of there are people doing experiments on the pulmonary system and they're looking at the pulmonary system, but there aren't people looking at it from different perspectives. So essentially we just have a bunch of, and I, I don't, I, I don't want to get this wrong. I want to be careful with this because they, they are uh, very far from anti-vax. Mm -hmm. They're, they're very careful in their scientific exploration. So they really want to understand things and they, they don't want to have dogmatic dialogue essentially yeah. is they want to actually have open dialogue and try to find an answer. That's not, they, they mm -hmm. want as much free speech as possible to find the best ideas that they can. And so their, their issue is with people that end up rooting themselves in these boxes into this dogmatic area. Mm -hmm. And from there kind of, as you were saying with the, the eugenicists, it's, anything outside of our dogma is wrong and our dogma becomes a echo chamber or a positive feedback loop in which we add something to it and that starts to perpetuate itself. And, and it can be very difficult to parse through a lot of the mm -hmm. literature on 
the the closed system schools mm -hmm. of thought because they end up creating their own language and it's very difficult to understand the language because it's something that they've created and it's all based around a central idea that is taken to be a priori is correct. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, I think that's an interesting aspect. And there's a, there's a battle I always have with um, the dialogue and being able to off offer opportunity for conversation. And I want people to have free speech, but if you don't have a basis of understanding in the same way that you're describing these languages, if you don't have the language of science or the language of whatever the practice is, it's, in, it's, nigh impossible to begin to have that dialogue or have the base baseline understanding to look at the box or compare compare what your dialogue is to someone else's because we don't share that learned language mm -hmm. or we don't share that learned dialogue about a particular phenomenon um and often i find it interesting to um talk with people that have have other have these other kind of views about the nature of understanding and science and the world in general both because they come at it from a different linguistic view. They come at it describing it in a different way that I would, as someone who's been in steeped in academia and steeped in the nature or steeped in the scientific pro or scientific culture for so long mm -hmm. to allow myself that vulnerability to go, I don't know how you speak in this. What do you, what is your dialogue about this space and how can I both engage with that space, but also present my side of the space to you? and bring us bring us both together to a better understanding of which one um which closures or understandings are more useful for reality and that make this if that makes sense right yeah, whether or not absolutely. each one is whether or not each one is valid where which one's more valid than the other who knows it might be that neither of them are right mm -hmm. we might come to a, there might be a discussion and we might come to an ultimate disagreement about which closure is more useful one might be more useful in one context one might be more useful in another so it kind of, it's kind of always that interplay of allowing people to allowing people into the language of the space mm -hmm. more than anything right god you make such a good point there I, especially mm -hmm. with the the rate at which we can consume information now and even the more, more so the rate at which information is available so yeah. not necessarily how much we consume but how much is available to everyone else to consume yeah. because as parts of a complex system if i consume something so if, if you and i read all of the same books mm -hmm then we can have a really good dialogue about the books that we've read and, and I can say things. So mm -hmm. uh, I, th I think a good example of this is Herman Hess. He's someone that is, he's a, he's a novel writer and he uses all of these, he brings all of these different ideas together. So he brings in, in Jung and lots of other, like other psychoanalytic perspectives. And so he uses this language. And so when you read Hess, it's very similar to the art that we were talking about is mm -hmm. that, there's the knowledge within the book and then there's the knowledge within the observer mm -hmm. and those two things create ideas together. So mm -hmm. I look at a book differently than you might look at a book unless we had looked and unless we'd read all of the same books. And even then there are still other yeah. biosocial, biopsychosocial yeah. factors all, that all, all play in. Right. And so uh, uh, the, the thing that I really like what you said about the language aspect is that, we really have to be sure that we're on the same footing with our language that we use because language is evolving so fast and words are the meaning of words change very quickly and the emotion behind those words i don't think changes at the rate at which we would like it to no so that's something that when when you explain the definition to a word you have to be cognizant of the other people that are involved in the conversation so that you're mm -hmm. not talking about two completely different concepts because mm -hmm. often we find ourselves in a place where I'm explaining something from everything from my a priori and you're explaining something mm -hmm. from your a priori and information that maybe you've recently stumbled upon that I'm not quite caught up with is mm -hmm. going to impact the way that I see your argument. Yeah. And I might, I might believe that your argument becomes benevolent because of a particular word that you used that I don't have the same mm -hmm. system of language as you. Yeah. And even understanding the context in which the words are used um, mm -hmm. to give a, Another a word that is a statement that is typically used um, and has a very significant difference between different circles. Um, the term genetically modified as a statement mm -hmm. um, has huge contextual difference depending on if you're talking to a plant geneticist, a uh, human a human uh, gene therapist, a uh, organic food grower, or an agriculturalist. Right, all of these circles that term has significantly different meanings. 
Mm -hmm. um, germline testing as another statement. Uh, big, lots of big words. Um, in plant let genetics, me my, let me get my tinfoil hat and add a yeah, exactly right. right. We're giving we're giving you some of the tinfoil hat words. Germline testing in plants is so the germline is the germinating line. That is essentially what is the reproductive structure or reproductive tissue within the within a within a plant. Um, germline testing in humans isn't related to the germline. They take a blood sample, which is as far from the germline as you can possibly get. Our germline in humans is the egg and the sperm. Yep. Those are our germline kind of general endpoints. Right. Um, whereas germline testing in something in, in mammals and animals in general is all from blood and the genetics related to our tissues and the X and Y chromosome, probably, most likely. Mm -hmm. This is based on my presumptions and how it works in animal genetics. Um, ironically enough, I'm less versed in that, but we're physiotherapy. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> But if I use a statement like germline testing in a conversation with an individual who is um, based in an understanding of organics and farming and a different, different lens, that statement in and of itself can be inflammatory. It can be, it can be uncertain, right? It's something that they may not even have familiarity with. And in, in having unfamiliarity with it, it can become something that is sounds hostile in the sense that it's jargon that I'm using that might be trying to belittle someone else, right? Mm -hmm. And by, and it's not in no means, in no way that does that person necessarily intend to use it that way, but it might be interpreted as such through the lens of that person's lived experience. And until you can sit back and go, okay, wait, 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 what do you know by, ger what do you know of germline testing? What is your description of that statement? And then by taking that step back, it takes, it makes conversation longer but it sets ground rules and sets ground context in order to let people at least know where our boundaries are of understanding and mm -hmm. where each of our spheres of language and spheres of world knowledge can intersect and where they don't and how we can kind of start playing with that interplay and trying to bring them closer together. <sighs> I absolutely like that's you, you mm -hmm. put that very, very well. I think that that's one of the, I'm, I'm trying to understand what's happening with media and mm -hmm. flow of information. Oh my God. And I, I, I go on TikTok every few days and it just, I, I know that people can curate it. I like, I have curated mine mm -hmm. to, I, 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 I follow a bunch of people that I don't necessarily agree with people that have differing perspectives from myself yeah. in so that I can understand what other people are saying and don't find myself in my own little echo chamber. Mm -hmm. And, what ends up happening is the the duration is so short that any debate between people is it finishes in it, it starts as one person calling the other person a son of a bitch and it ends in giving a very very brief unnuanced perspective on what the issue is hmm. and that's why i like long-form podcasts i i don't i also don't like legacy media anymore because they've become so far from bipartisan which that is, which is legacy media uh sorry uh, legacy media would be um fox news cnn oh, yeah, msnbc okay, yeah, that's like the, all the, the old, big stuff, the big old stuff. media right mm -hmm. yeah that would be that would be the best way to describe it old media oh, yeah. so mm -hmm. that seems to be on the way out and it seems to me that apps like tiktok where there's this there was this uh i, I posted i reposted something on my instagram story a while ago and it was of mm -hmm. a it was a TikTok where a bunch of people took an original video and each of them added a little bit to it. You sent it to me. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's so really I, cool. That was amazing. And I yeah. sent that and I I post I repost that. I don't post a lot of stuff like that, but I repost that because I think that that's how media is going to end up going over the mm -hmm. next few years is that each yeah. person, it starts off with an original video. So in that case, a news story yeah. or not a news story. It's, it's, a, it's a joke, but it turns into a news yeah. story. It's a parody. Yeah. And it starts off with an original video and then from there people add on to it to give differing perspectives and you can always trace it back to the original video. So mm -hmm. you have a, a, a consistent source throughout and yeah. it's always evolving. So there's always mm -hmm. new information put, being put onto things. And that's something that I, I do like about TikTok is your ability to stitch and reply to people in time, in real time, face to face. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm, I'm really trying to understand what is going on with the media because it's obvious like legacy media is obviously not bipartisan yeah. and i the think the issue i have with current media and the way that it is presented is um media as a process is, a, is something to be consumed mm -hmm. 
It's not something to inform necessarily. Right. Right. It's entertainment. And to create entertainment and create consumption, it needs to be uh, rapid. It needs to be palatable in a quick period of time, and it needs to be catchy. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a reason clickbait titles started appearing on YouTube. It's because they got people to click them. Yeah. Um, in the same way that Insta or something like Twitter has 120 or is it 255 characters now? I'm not sure. Um, I never you know, got the Twitter. I'm too scared of it. Uh, I don't have, I'm not on Twitter either, but in principle, you only have 200 or 120 to 255 characters to make your argument or make your mm -hmm. statement. So the only a way you can have a statement is if it's bold, if it's inflammatory, or if it's like, it can't, it, you can't make a nuanced argument in that amount of time. Right. So the issue I have with a lot of social media platforms is they implicitly due to the way that they're consumed, create bias or create dichotomies very quickly because right, people sensationalization yeah exactly sensationalization right we don't have the space to create a nuanced discussion necessarily because it's only going to exist on the screen for 15 seconds mm -hmm. so it's easier to call the other person a son of a bitch instead of going well i actually kind of disagree with some of his views but i find that the, his arguments on the economy or economics of things and social justice are actually fairly valid you can't mm -hmm. say that and like it doesn't no one no one takes the time to listen to that or explore that mm -hmm. right Despite that, it's still a place that we all collect media or information from. I don't use Reddit for much, but I scroll Reddit, World News, and other places, um, and other just different pages. And again, I'm just as complicit with it as as everyone else. I read the titles. I look mm. for the look for the things that seem catchy enough for me to click on it one more time and look at the news article or top look five at comments, book, right? Yeah, whichever it is, right? You pull yourself, and it pulls you, and it's the same way, and it's that same what is the catchiest way we can make this statement? What is the boldest way we can make this statement to get people to watch it? Mm -hmm. And in doing that practice, because it's a consumer consumer medium and they're trying to get clicks and they're trying to get click through rates and they're trying to get advertising money, it creates that dichotomy. It creates that sensationalism that facilitates these dissensions between individuals, which is why often I think the, a lot of things that happen on the internet, people think people are more different than they are mm -hmm. uh, from each other, right? Yeah. we have vastly more similarities between people than differences mm -hmm. just because someone's post something super inflammatory on a website they're just at that point they're just a piece of text on a screen that is inflammatory right mm -hmm. and you're basing the whole character of an individual based on this one inflammatory statement um so things like TikTok and things like instagram and things like twitter and what have you facebook is a nightmare right now um especially if you have family members that are interesting um, just, it, uh, but it's important to have those family members because it keeps you aware of the different dialogues that occur. Mm -hmm. um, I think there needs to be some degree of, oh, what's the word? Not transparency, not responsibility. It's like ownership of your mm -hmm. ideas because you can be so, e it's so easy to be an anonymous face on the screen and so mm -hmm. on an anonymous face in the background. Um, to give a great horrible example right now, um, the Israeli got, or Israeli Palestine uh, murder, gen mm -hmm. a genocide thing that's happening right now. Yeah. Um, Israel just bombed one of the last reporting stations for Palestine. So mm -hmm. all the information coming out of that area right now is mostly through the lens of is of the Israel movement. Right. Um, Right, which creates a problem because it creates a vacuum about what the act, what the dialogue is in its entirety. Right, mm -hmm. we don't have both sides anymore presenting the information on these platforms that are intentionally sensationalist. Yeah, to create click through rates. So, how do you create a nuanced dialogue if you only have both one side, but also a sensationalized one side? Mm -hmm. Right. So I have an issue. The, the issue I have with social media is essentially its snappiness and the way that the way that its algorithms essentially promote quick information right and we're um to give uh go ahead go ahead yeah. i was i was just going to say neurologically we're structured to identify danger and harm far more than order and peace yeah exactly and so things that there's a I'm not, I'm not sure what you would call them maybe the progressive rationalists but steve pinkner is is part of that and there are a few other ones uh, um what's his name matt ridley uh, Longberg, Bjorn Longberg, but they're essentially what they've done is look at all of the great things going on in the world and said, 
well, look at all of this. This is great. It's not happening like that as bad things tend to happen like that. There, yeah. there are shootings and there are other things that happen very quickly. But uh, what is it? I think 168,000 people are lifted out of absolute poverty every day. Yeah, exactly. Which, which is a title that likely should be on the news every single day, but it's not because it doesn't, it doesn't activate our amygdala. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't arouse us. It doesn't, not, not in the way that something like a, a, a shooting or other or things. Car accident exactly. Or... And obviously those things should be, those, those things should be addressed. Yeah. But, but it is important to understand that the world isn't as horrible as we mm -hmm. perceive it to be. And I think that yeah. the, the slogan for that group of people is something along lines of um, what do we want progressive improvement? When do we want it in due course? <laughs> I like it. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's fair. Good. And I think I agree. It's because of that click through rates and the uh, immediate responses of our brains to fear and intensity and threat, um, which was adaptive at one point. Um, mm -hmm. Not exactly. It's still kind of, it's still technically adaptive, just in a different context. Um, right. It's just being, it's being used, it's being utilized mm -hmm. in a, in a way that it's never been before as many things are in our, yeah. in our exactly. current um, zeitgeist. Yeah. Um, in the same way that it's being used in that way, I think we need to, again, as you said, bring in these aspects of, hey, things are, things are happening that are good or mm -hmm. good in the current context of conducive to human existence uh, yeah. for a longer period of time than we have for now, mm -hmm. right? And conducive to general human flourishing, whatever that means, depending on the philosopher you're talking about um, and all of that context. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully it means being mean is not nice and everyone gets to live a generally well, a general life with good circles and food and the roof over their head and everything else um but i think yeah i agree that's an aspect that we need to explore a little bit more thoroughly especially in media right which is why i think i think like things like um r slash i bleach is a great web page on reddit um if you ever feeling bad you go to that page you feel great because it's all people just posting videos of their pets yeah doing things and i'm like this is this is what i need mm -hmm. good things happen out there Right. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, good stuff. All right. Do you wanna do you wanna stop there? Sure. Perfect. That Thanks. Fine. So that was awesome. <laughs> I really loved that. I had a great time. That was. Well, that it's was, super great catching lovely. up too. Yeah. Here, I'll put this on pause, and then then we can have a little debrief. Yeah. Sure. So, Sounds good. Once again, thanks a lot, Lucas, for coming. Absolutely. On. I really appreciate it. Yeah. No problem. Thanks you. Thanks, Josh, for letting me come and have a chat. Seems great. Yeah.